My name's Lou Frederick. Uh, I want to talk about my experiences here in Oregon. I arrived here in Portland uh, in 1974. I had taken the train across just from uh, Atlanta to Seattle, took the bus down from Seattle and I got down here and um, was greeted by people saying hello as I walked through the bus station and I wanted to know what they wanted because I was a little surprised to see people just say hello uh, spontaneously. I actually came here to join a mime troupe. I grew up in a lot of places. I actually was born in Pullman, Washington. Uh, my father was, got his PhD there. Uh, then we moved to Rhode Island and then we moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But most of the time we were in Southern University in Baton Rouge. Uh, I remember vividly the water fountains that were colored and, and white water fountains. We were in a, in a department store and I went over to drink at the water fountain and the colored water fountain was broken. So I was drinking out of the white water fountain and I was probably about four or five years old. And the department store came over to my dad and said, that boy can't drink out of that water fountain, it says white. And my father turned to the guy and said, well, that, I, I'm sorry, he can't read. Uh, I could read just fine. Uh, I just didn't, I wasn't gonna put, that, put up with that. And I was gonna drink, drink some water. Uh, we left Baton Rouge after the demonstrations and we moved to Atlanta. So we went from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, in Atlanta, our neighbors were uh, directly involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, my playmates um, were at, at, at Oglethorpe Elementary School were Marty Yolanda and Dexter King. Uh, Dr. King was the father of my playmates and the, and the guy who told me to quit running through the house and to, to uh, turn down the music. I marched every other weekend or so uh, with, the, with, uh, with various people. And I would be carrying something that would say um, one man, one vote, or free somebody, or something like that. I was probably 11, 12 years old. I ended up desegregating my high school. So that first day was a, a difficult one. It began when I was 13. I lived here in Southwest Atlanta. Channel 8 has uh, a, I think we broke it up into a two-part series on my um, trip back to my high school in my 20th reunion, which was 1989. Daily fights over race and other issues were not uncommon. So I ended up desegregating my high school. And then there were the guys who showed me their junior Ku Klux Klan cards. I think there's still a lot of underlying prejudice that um, it's sad to say, but until that last generation dies off, it's gonna be there. Every day we fight to push back prejudice, the, the fear of things we don't know. When I got to Portland, uh, I started teaching. I taught for two years at the Metropolitan Learning Center, left that and, and um, went into radio for six months and into television and I was on, the, on television and at Channel 8 from uh, 1977 to 1993. I went to all 36 counties as a reporter, uh, and but I was a reporter with a photographer with a, a marked Channel 8 news van, uh, and so that clearly had an impact as well. But I, I got a chance to know some people who were who didn't know that, and we had we had good conversations uh, in Burns and in Prineville and in Lakeview. But I've also had some not so good experiences, and one of them was was in a Channel 8 news van. We went out to do a series of stories uh, on the coast, and on the way back we came through King City. And as we're driving along, we got pulled over and the police officer took a, a long time to come up to the car. He called for backup. Uh, the photographer uh, said to me, you know, you need to get, your, um, you need to get your, the registration. I said, I'm not moving until he asked me to. The cop came up to the window and said, um, you know, you're, you're going pretty fast through here. I need your registration. And uh, so I said, the registration's in the glove compartment. The glove compartment is below me in this car. Um, I will get it for you. And I started to reach for it slowly. And he, the gun came out, and it's pointed across the face of the photographer. And uh, I'm, I said, listen, you know, if you want me to get the registration, I'll do that, but I'm not gonna get shot getting it. He said, I need to see your hands at all time. I said, well, that's gonna be difficult because I've gotta go reach down here. So one hand, I'm reaching down slowly, got the registration out, handed it to, a uh, photographer handed, sent, passed it along and, uh, and came back and said, well, you're going pretty fast, but I'm just going to give you a warning for that. 
photographer turned to me after that and said, what the hell was that? And I said, welcome to my world. Now I'm a state senator. There's a long list of, of bills that we're gonna look at, but we really need to look at a basic attitude, a change in the attitude. And the attitude change that's one that I would like to see, and I, and I don't expect that it's gonna happen by any means overnight, but the attitude change that's got to happen as well is folks understanding that uh, darker skin doesn't mean you get a chance to not uh, consider people a people. I was stopped at least three times now um, coming down my street. He said, well, just, I'm just checking. I said, no, you're not just checking. You want to know why I'm in this, in this neighborhood and it's a gentrified neighborhood and you don't expect to see my face here. I get it. But I live right here, and I've lived in this house since 1977. For me, any time I see a police officer behind me, I wonder whether I'm going to live the rest of the day. Because I have no idea whether, the, whether they're going to be in a bad mood, or trying trolling for somebody, or just wanting to, to show that they're dominant somehow. I have no idea. And that is how I have to deal with things. So I have friends of mine who are police officers, white and black and Latino and Native American and Asian, um, and they, they are all good people that I know of, but I don't know their, some of their colleagues because some of their colleagues can, can decide that they need to show, show how tough they are. I think I can, make, I can help make a change. That's the key for me. Can I change this? Um, that's my job. My father and, and Dr. King and my mother, they all said one thing. They said, your job is to make things better for the people who come after you. That's what I'm trying to do.